Hey everybody, welcome to what is our first full content lecture of the semester. Um, I'm going to post a new one of these every Monday. My hope for them is that they'll provide you with some basic, um, some basic context for the readings that we do, for the discussions that we have, um, as well as some foundational uh, ideas, concepts um, that are going to help you improve your knowledge about African American history. Uh, I promise to keep these relatively short, about 50 minutes each, five zero. Uh, they may sometimes go a little bit longer, especially as we move into um, the 19th century around the era of the Civil War, as well as in the late 18th century, the age of uh, the American Constitution, when there's some kind of complex legal issues that I want to try to explain as carefully as possible. Uh, but again, I'll do my best to keep them about 50 minutes. And then of course, you'll have um, just a little more than a day uh, after watching the lecture or after I post the lecture uh, to, to take a short quiz, usually about five questions. Certainly nothing to worry about. If you watch the, uh, the lecture and you take reasonably uh, good notes, you'll be more than prepared for these quizzes. It's really just a chance for you to boost your grade. So today what I'd like to do is begin with an overview of a few core concepts uh, that are particularly important uh, for the first couple of weeks of our course, but are also really essential for understanding um, how African American history itself came to be um, and what uh, made African slavery in the Americas, and in the case of this course in North America, different than other forms of slavery in the history of the world. So uh, one crucial term that I'm going to throw around a lot um, that's going to come up in some of our readings is chattel slavery. Um, this is one of the most important concepts we're going to deal with for the entire course, uh, and I'm going to return to it constantly. Uh, chattel is just another word for property, right? Um, it means that enslaved people in North America um, were people with a price, right? They were commodities. They could be bought or sold. I'm going to switch my slide there, as you can see is happening in, um, in this advertisement, right? Uh, in a chattel slavery system, uh, slaves are pieces of property, they can be owned, they can be bought and sold, and because they have a price, uh, it's possible for them to be investments, right, particularly as they live longer and longer, um, and that's going to be something that I return to as we, as we move through this course, the, the average lifespan for enslaved people increases from the 17th century, the 1600s, up into the Civil War era, um, in part because there's a lot of wealth tied into enslaved people. And so enslavers um, took, great, took great pains to protect that investment by prolonging enslaved people's lives. Um, but we'll get to that more down the road. Um, so, you know, these are kind of clumsy analogies, but some modern comparisons you could make, right? Think about pieces of property in your life uh, or the lives of people you know that they might um, tie their wealth into in order to, um, to protect an investment, right? Something like a home or a car. Um, that is really what enslaved people were in the history of colonial North America and in the United States. Okay. Um, and in order to ensure the stability of this system, right? Any investment that's going to be worth something needs to be relatively stable. Um, the investor needs to have confidence that it's going to be around for a long time. Slavery had to be made hereditary. And so what we're going to learn over the next few weeks is that um, the assemblies, the legislative bodies of early American colonies, places like Maryland and Virginia, they made slavery a uh, hereditary condition, right? An enslaved person was enslaved because they were born enslaved. That is their, their parents, in particular their mother uh, was enslaved. 
Um, why does any of this matter? Um, it distinguishes the enslavement of African descended peoples in the Americas um, uh, from other forms of slavery throughout human history. Um, we're not gonna, because this course is so short, we're not gonna have a great deal of time to go deep into understanding a sort of comparative slavery uh, and thinking about other systems of enslavement. Um, but just to be brief with it, in, in some societies that have a form of slavery, the enslaved um, are members of the political community. Um, it is possible for them sell them themselves to own slaves. Um, it might be possible for them to have what would have looked like freedom in the context of African American slavery. Um, so the conditions of slavery or the conditions of what you call on freedom change depending on the broader social and cultural and political and economic context. Um, so in uh, the Americas, slavery is really, um, it's an economic condition, it's a political condition, it's a legal condition um, that can never be transcended, right? Unless the enslaved person finds a way uh, to emancipate themselves, right? By escaping or um, uh, by perhaps finding someone to help them uh, emancipate themselves. Um, this chattel principle is at the center of everything uh, in American slavery. As the black abolitionist in order, James Pennington put it in the 19th century, the being of African-American slavery, right? The, like the essence of African-American slavery, its soul and body lives and moves in the chattel principle, the property principle, the bill of sale principle. Um, and as I said, we're gonna, we're gonna dive much deeper into that uh, as we move through the course. Um, another term I just wanna raise very quickly here, and this is something I'll probably talk about in every lecture and perhaps in every discussion, um, is race. Race is a really tricky concept um, because it is a social, it's a legal, a political designation that masquerades as a natural uh, designation, right? Race um, is an ideology. It's an idea uh, that is used by oppressors to justify oppression of a designated group. Um, uh, what race does is it's an attempt to designate a group as naturally inferior, right? Um, the historian Barbara Fields has written about this um, in an article that we're probably not going to have a chance to, to look at in any great depth, but you'll probably hear me cite this article uh, continuously throughout the semester. And here's how she puts this. All human societies assume that nature has ordained their, so their social arrangements. Or to put it another way, part of what human beings understand by the word nature is the sense of inevitability that gradually becomes attached to a predictable social routine, right? So um, what we talk about when we talk about nature is oftentimes custom that's just been repeated over and over and over again for a really long time, often repeated because law has mandated it or um, elites in a society have mandated it somehow. Um, and then it becomes to seem like it's existed for time immemorial. Well, race is really exactly that, right? Um, so one of the things that we're going to focus on, especially in these first two weeks of the course, is how the ideology of race, the idea of race was invented in particularly in the 17th and early 18th centuries, that's the 1600s, the 1700s, um, in places like Virginia to justify the use of enslaved Africans to create wealth by um, working in tobacco fields in particular. Um, and as a way to distinguish between enslaved Africans and 
indentured European servants who themselves were experiencing a form of unfreedom. Okay, so these these distinctions, they come about over time. They're historical distinctions. They're not natural distinctions. Okay, this is, this is how historians think about the world. Um, we tend to see human agency. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for decision-making. We're looking for choice. Um, and that's what we see when we think about the history of race. Um, all of that might seem kind of confusing or bizarre, right? We're, we're so trained by the society around us and by hundreds of years of human history to think about race in a, in a way that's very different than what I'm saying. But just hang, hang with that idea. Just hold on to it. We're going to keep coming back to it. Um, the next uh, concept, a little simpler to understand, transatlantic slave trade. Uh, this is the trade in human property that moved enslaved Africans uh, to the Americans over the course of roughly 400 years. Um, this is an incredibly long human history. Um, it represents the largest forced migration of humans in world history. Uh, and it dramatically altered the histories of three major uh, regions of the world, uh, the Americas, uh, Africa, of course, as well as Europe. Um, a couple of things I just want you to keep in mind. The transatlantic slave trade isn't just one thing, right? Nothing that lasts for 400 years in human history is just one thing, right? It's dynamic, it changes over time. Um, so when we refer to it, we have to try our best to pay attention to um, the specific moment that we're talking about, right? The, the transatlantic slave trade in say the 1500s, right? Which is largely dominated by Portugal and Spain um, is really, really different than the transatlantic slave trade of say the 1750s or 60s, which is dominated um, in part by England, um, which is moving enslaved people to places that they had not gone in the 16th century, which is much larger. There's more money at stake. There's more bodies being moved. Um, so it just, it changes over time. Um, the purposes of the trade change over time. The major players, um, all of these things are, are kind of constantly in flux. Um, the big picture, the big takeaway here is that the transatlantic slave trade uh, changed the world. It fundamentally made the world that we live in today, right? It built empires. It created new cultures. Um, most obviously it created African-American culture, right? right? It was at least the initial spark that then creates, uh, that leads to the creation of African-American culture. Um, and it populated the Americas with enslaved people. Um, and it depopulated West Africa. Um, so a sort of basic concept, just a sort of shorthand, if you see me using that term, this is what I'm referring to, and we'll both recognize that this is a much more complex process than we can possibly um, discuss in a single semester, um, particularly one where we need to move into the United States, uh, the history of the United States, um, which begins to diverge somewhat from the transatlantic slave trade. Um, one more term, Middle Passage. Uh, this is the journey across the Atlantic from Africa to the Americas um, that millions and millions of enslaved people were forced to take. Um, this is a, uh, a brutal uh, period in enslaved people's lives uh, in which enslavers attempted to turn people into property, right? To create the chattel principle. Um, and they did that by chaining people together, um, by beating them, um, by otherwise forcing them to submit to their status as slaves. Uh, this is the defining event in the lives of most enslaved people. Um, and it was also, and this is a really important point to just take away, uh, the most common path of immigration uh, to the Americas for about 300 years, um, which is stunning, 
from about the 16th to the 19th century, the vast majority of people who came to the Americas did so as enslaved people um, who had survived uh, the horrors of the Middle Passage. Um, roughly 80% of immigrants to the Americas were enslaved. That's about 12.5 million people. Um, I've posted a short clip to the course website from the film Amistad that, that sort of captures the horrors of the, the Middle Passage. It's eight minutes long. Um, it's definitely worth watching. My criticism of it is that it is only eight minutes long. Um, uh, uh, the, the real Middle Passage, right? To, to, to truly understand the horrors of the Middle Passage, you have to think about time. It would take weeks, um, and in most cases, it would take months and months to complete the Middle Passage. And throughout that journey, what enslaved people were experiencing was malnourishment. What they were experiencing was physical violence, sexual violence, um, uh, disease, depravity, etc. Right, and they're also experiencing uncertainty. They don't know where they're going, and I think that that's one of the really unique horrors of the Middle Passage. Um, it was being these are people being lifted uh, from one station in life, from one place uh, that is familiar, um, and taken to the complete unknown, where they'll die. Right. It is, uh, it is, is perhaps the most dreadful experience in the history of human affairs. Um, one more point um, I just want to make, and I'll go back to that map I was looking at uh, a little bit earlier. Here's a couple more middle passage images. Um, the vast, vast majority of enslaved people who uh, were taken from Africa uh, went to Brazil or they went to various islands in the Caribbean. Um, only a relatively small number came directly to mainland North America. Now, other enslaved people uh, were bought and sold in the Caribbean um, and eventually ended up in North America. Um, but the direct trade from Africa to North America was, again, relatively uh, small. Um, still quite large, but relatively small. Um, in the weeks ahead, we're going to discuss how slave societies nonetheless developed in North America. And they did so in ways that are kind of different than other parts of the Americas. Um, so we're going to focus on the outcome of what is one of the smaller migrations. Um, and then we're going to consider how it was that this relatively small migration, and as you can see, this arrow is much skinnier. And the, and the thickness of these arrows denotes the size of the population that's um, being forced into migration, right? Um, how this relatively small population grows uh, into the world's largest slave society by the 19th century, okay? So the, the United States takes a different path to building its slave population. Okay, so those are some useful terms and concepts, they may come up quite a bit in the next few weeks, and, and there's things that you're going to want to take away from the class for sure. Um, let's take a few minutes to just consider the world before the transatlantic slave trade, and then just put a few ideas on the table about how Europe and West Africa came um, to create this system, uh, this, this global trading system um, in the 15th and 16th centuries, right? Where did all of this come from? How did it even start? Just really basic questions. Um, as I was saying at the beginning, I think it's easy to imagine that all of this has always existed, right? Um, it's easy to think in terms of like very simplistic binaries um, that Europeans have always sort of had grand designs on plundering Africa, that Europeans were sort of sitting on their continent full of racist ideas and ready to bring them to Africa um, and, and uh, sub force people into the submission of slavery, um, or that slavery and its abuses were somehow these just natural things, right? None of this is natural though, right? 
none of it um, had necessarily to happen, right? All of these things are products of choices, decisions, context. Um, and in fact, all of them, things like racist ideas um, or racial thinking um, are actually quite recent developments in the grand scheme of human history, right? We're, we're talking about roughly the last 500 years, which is um, to someone who's interested in ancient history, not long at all. This is, this is the recent past uh, from a certain perspective. Um, so this is an important thing to remember. Racism, racial inequality, racist exploitation of labor, forced migration, all of these things that have shaped our world so profoundly, all these ugly realities of African-American history, um, they're the outcomes of specific choices and processes in the history of the world um, over the last half uh, millennium. People made these things happen, merchants, political leaders, um, poor workers and sailors from Europe who themselves had little choice but to participate, uh, church officials, planters. Um, thousands of these people made the world as we've come to know it, and they did so in many cases by buying and selling and enslaving millions of West Africans. Um, okay, so back to where I was. How did this all start? The big questions here are why Europeans engaged in the buying and selling of Africans, um, what sorts of societies they, they encountered uh, when they arrived in Africa, how European slave trading changed African societies, and why Africans uh, engaged in the trade as well, which they did very actively. Um, so let's start with Europe in the 15th century. This is the 1400s. It's around the time the first Western Europeans were attempting to trade in African slaves. Uh, Western Europe was a pretty backwards place in the 1400s. Um, there was not significant seafaring ability for most of the continent, um, especially early in the century. Um, it produced little of value in global trade, uh, the continent that is. Uh, particularly compared with East and Central Asia, um, places that could produce things like coveted spices and silk. It was beset by war and tribalism. Um, and it was not a continent of nation states as we know it today, right? There was no Germany, no France, no Italy, no Great Britain as we have come to know them, right? Those things are all going to be um, created over time as well. And it's going to take hundreds of years for them to develop. Um, instead, there's thousands and thousands of principalities, there's church parishes, there's m villages, and most people never travel more than a couple of miles from their homes. All right. So the world for Europeans in the 15th century was a small place uh, for the vast majority of them. What the continent did have going for it uh, was a fairly large population. There's about 100 million people in uh, Europe during uh, the 15th century. Um, and there's steadily increasing wealth and longevity. Uh, Europeans were fairly skilled um, uh, farmers. Um, and particularly after the Black Death of the 1300s, they were increasingly able to produce enough food for a growing population. Um, and they were also quite good at things like fabricating metal. Um, this is what I uncovered when I was looking for 14th century Europe. As you can tell, I'm a historian of the United States. So 14th century Europe is a little bit outside of uh, my wheelhouse, um, which hinders my ability to search for really cool, really powerful images but those will come in time, I promise. Um, and crucially, um, there's, there's one technology that's especially important, which is the printing press. Um, right? Europeans in the 14th century were able to reproduce and circulate ideas more rapidly, um, really than any, any uh, human society ever had in history. Okay, And that, that form of communication is going to make things like um, exchanging ideas 
about technology possible in ways that they've never been before, which is going to make things like seafaring um, possible on a scale that they've never been possible before. So a backwards place, a relatively backwards place that, in, that has some indications of uh, future growth. Um, one last point about Europe in this period that, that I think is really significant. Unlike other powerful regions of the world at the time, um, Europe uh, was really not a land of self-sustaining societies. Um, Europeans had to trade in order to, if not survive, then to thrive, right? Um, which meant they were, they were there's, they're kind of always rapidly improving communication and navigation because they have to. Right, they're they're engaged in long distance trade, um, and and this uh, need for trade also fosters competition, um, which often turned to war. Remember, lots of small, um, crowded communities kind of piled on top of one another. Growing communities, they're all right next to each other. That means conflict, um, and conflict could could mean innovation. Innovation. Um, in shipping, innovation in weapons, innovation um, in supplying armies, innovation in maintaining supply lines across really long distances. Um, so Europe's a backward, conflict-ridden place, but it's from that conflict that Europeans are getting better at certain things, getting better at making weapons, getting better at producing food, at building ships, mastering um, the navigation of the high seas. So amid these changes, it's the mariners of um, Portugal, and here's an image of the printing press that I should have put up a moment ago. Um, it's the mariners of Portugal, which sits at a sort of um, crossroads between Western Europe, the Mediterranean, and West Africa, who first start venturing um, to the West African coast. Um, here is a, it's a picture of Portuguese mariners uh, doing their thing in the, this is probably from the 16th century, the 1500s. Um, by the early 16th century, um, even going back to the late uh, 15th century, roughly around the age, uh, the year 1460, um, the Portuguese had begun exploring sub Saharan uh, coastal Africa. Uh, let's see if we can pull it up. Yeah. So they begin here. Um, uh, in West Africa, and slowly over the next century or so, they move their way um, into the Gulf of Guinea um, and along what becomes known as the Slave Coast. Okay, um, they are exploiting this region for its riches, for gold, for ivory, um, and in particular, uh, for slaves that they can impress to labor in their new colonies cultivating things like grapes for wine or sugar. Um, and this is making Portugal a very rich country. Um, and in time, um, others, particularly the English, the Dutch, the Spanish, are going to uh, follow this path. They're going to intensify slave trading, and they're going to dig deeper into um, this coastline, um, as well as begin facilitating the extraction of enslaved people from uh, the interior. So that's what's going on in Europe. Let's talk about Africa for a few minutes. Um, West Africa at the time of European contact was a very diverse corner of the globe. Um, I think sometimes we fail to think of the past as a diverse place. I was kind of suggesting this before. Um, uh, oftentimes I see folks reduce the past to these very simplistic overarching categories. Um, things like European, which I'm kind of doing right now by saying the European and African context. Um, European and African, right? Two terms that really nobody in this period identified themselves as, right? No one was going around saying, I'm a European. Right? They, they wouldn't have done that. No one um, who was enslaved, nor uh, no one who facilitated the capture of enslaved people would have said, I'm an African. 
right, people, um, nor, nor would these people have identified for the most part as white or black, right? These aren't, these aren't the identities that we've come to think of them as. Um, these are essentially useless terms for this period of European contact. They become extremely important over time, as I was saying at the beginning, but in this early phase, they're not, they're not as significant. Um, just as Europe is teeming with thousands of villages and languages and spiritual traditions, so is West Africa, right? These are wildly diverse places. Um, uh, home to, to hundreds of different groups of people. Um, in fact, West Africa is probably among the most diverse places on the world. Um, again, it's a land of multifarious languages and religions and social organizations. I've often um, heard people say something like um, Africans enslaved each other. Um, perhaps I think they're, they're speaking to the reality that African people participated in the slave trade. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But the claim itself to say uh, they enslaved each other uh, is racist, right? It assumes that all black skinned people are members of the same group. Um, this is not something that we would extend. This is not a logic that we would extend, say, to Europeans. Right. If you were to to see, uh, if you were to talk about the Franco-Prussian War of the 1870s, right, very few people would say, "Well, they went to war with each other. They were the same people, and they went to war with each other." Right. You would you would give people um, the benefit of recognizing differences as they understand them amongst themselves, right? But we don't extend that same benefit. Um, historically, we don't extend. Uh, that same benefit to African descended peoples anywhere in the world, right? That's, that's part of what makes racism what it is. Um, but we certainly don't extend it to early modern African history very much. So it's, it's really important to recognize complexity, diversity, difference um, in this part of the world. Um, uh, again, there's not a racial concept of Africanness um, as a dis as distinct from, say, Europeanness. Um, instead, identities, just like in Europe, they're frequently based on locality, village, clan, tribe, age, perhaps, um, or they might be based on skill or role in a community. Right, something like um, an artisan or craftsperson or something like this. Um, there were hundreds of states, small states throughout West Africa, um, and most of them were very, very small. Um, this is a key difference between sort of governance and power in West Africa and Europe is that in Europe, the tradition was to claim land um, as a bounty of war, right? One of the purposes of war is to extend geographical territory, um, but this is not the case uh, in West Africa in most, in most circumstances. Instead, um, these small states claimed people, um, uh, which was easier. You can bring people back to your territory and not have to worry about managing a distant land, right? Um, so many of these states remained small, uh, but exerted power by enslaving um, their neighbors. And again, this is there are many kinds of slavery existing in Africa at this time, um, but they are distinct from the sort of chattel slavery that we're going to see begin to develop between uh, or from the transatlantic slave trade. Um, these societies have a vast range, as you can imagine, of religious and spiritual beliefs, um, although there's some influence from Islam, um, and later on there'll be some influence from Christianity. Um, to some extent, older African religious traditions have survived in the Americas um, and continue to survive in the Americas, um, right? Such as voodoo, uh, voodoo practice in places like Haiti and Jamaica. Um, one crucial point to keep in mind, and as, as I'm on this point of uh, cultural difference throughout West Africa, 
um, is that the idea of what we would call class was really important in many West African societies, especially the larger ones, right? These places were stratified, socially stratified, meaning the difference between elites and commoners was very significant. Um, if we want to understand uh, the relationship of West African people to the slave trade, we need to recognize class stratification. Um, as one historian has put it, the ruling classes of West Africa um, were the offending parties, that is kings and chiefs and nobles. They worked with European traders um, and sought to leverage their relationships with Europeans um, into greater power for themselves. And one way they did that was pro by providing enslaved people to traders, right? Um, it's a great favor. It's a way to build um, reciprocity with uh, traders who have something that you might desire. Um, in short, elite Africans attempted to and frequently did build alliances with Europeans and vice versa, right? Europeans use elites as a sort of gateway into the slave trade. Um, these relationships, again, they're not static, right? They exist as long as both parties are happy with them. And when one party grows unhappy, they, they might turn on their, their old ally. Right, And something that we see over the 400 years of the transatlantic slave trade is that over time power shifts steadily into European traders' hands and they can increasingly exploit African elites. Um, but there's a very long period where they're really working essentially as equals, um, benefiting, uh, at least based on the interests they have in that time, um, by participating in the slave trade. Um, the, the idea, so one, one more point about this, the idea that Europeans orchestrated the slave trade through African elites, um, I think tells us something really significant about race and slavery. Um, I've often, I, I keep doing this thing where I say, I've often heard, but it's true. I hear so many cliches and stereotypes about the history of slavery that it becomes easy to use them to structure my thoughts here. But I've often heard folks say that transatlantic slavery, right, the mass enslavement of Africans can simply be explained by differences in skin color, right? Um, what they mean, I think, when they say that is that white Europeans were comfortable exploiting black Africans because they saw the latter as different and their and difference must have been inherently inferior and that's that. Uh, perhaps you've heard something similar to that before. Perhaps you've thought that before, you know, I, I, I am sure there was a time in my life where in trying to make sense of the significance of racism in our culture, I would have said, well, difference has to be the thing. Um, but as the evidence I'm, I'm playing with here suggests, and uh, as the historian Barbara Fields, again, cited again, has put, people are more readily perceived as inferior um, when they are already seen as oppressed. In a sense of inferiority does not come from mere difference, right? Um, a sense of another person's inferiority comes from this is what Fields is arguing, seeing a person who is oppressed. Um, Europeans enslaved, for the most part, commoners, who they saw were oppressed, right? Who they saw were already being exploited. They did not, for the most part, especially in the early period, enslave elites who they saw as powerful, right? So it wasn't, it wasn't simply, um, a difference in skin color that led Europeans to believe they could participate in this mass enslavement or they could um, create this mass enslavement. Rather, um, it was class difference as well, right? This is really important in the early going. Again, things change over time. 
And as we get into the history of colonial North America and into the United States, what we're going to start to see is that African Americans become both a race that is invented by law um, and a class that is invented by law. And they, they hold a very specific place in the broader social order by the design of the ruling elites of that society. Um, again, it's never just about race, um, but it's also never just about um, class either. So big picture, I know I'm kind of winding through some somewhat complex theoretical material here. Um, the big zoom out picture is that West Africa is a diverse place in the early modern period. It's culturally rich. Um, it's intensely competitive um, with many, many small states uh, struggling against one another um, frequently, like Europeans, um, existing in conflict with one another. Um, one last question I want, I want to talk about, and then uh, I will let you go, um, is how the slave trade itself functioned. Um, right? How, how, how did such a massive global undertaking work? Right? Where did enslaved people actually come from? Um, how were they captured? How were they transported onto cargo ships? Um, I think the, the most common stereotype is kidnapping. Um, and, and perhaps when we think about this, we imagine uh, Europeans launching uh, raids and kidnapping Africans and then taking them to ships. Um, that did happen in some cases, especially uh, in the early, earliest Portuguese encounters. Um, but Portuguese mariners learned very fast and this knowledge was able to spread to other European um, slave traders uh, quite quickly. The, the kidnapping is kind of a bad strategy. Um, if, you, if they were to launch kidnapping raids, a few things would happen. One, their own men would die, which is expensive. You don't want your crew to die when you're very far from your home port. Um, and second, you will alert your targets and they will begin to arm themselves and they will begin to resist you very, very strongly. And it will make it much harder to do the thing you want to do, which is seize as many people as possible and sell them um, and then impress them into labor, right? Um, so kidnapping is, is actually quite rare. Um, much more common, as I suggested earlier, was the sale of enslaved people by ruling African elites to European traders. Um, although that raises another question, which would be um, which people were sold? How did elites decide? Did they just, did they just randomly pick commoners um, and sell them off? Or was there something a bit more systematic at work here? And, and obviously it's the latter, right? Um, one way that uh, people became enslaved was um, a by, as byproducts of war, right? Um, as these many states of West Africa struggle against one another, uh, victors in war frequently enslaved their rivals and then sold them to Europeans. Um, this though becomes a problematic concept, right? Because when we talk about war, we tend to think of two combatants who can't agree about something and so they fight over it. Um, which would make slavery seem like a byproduct of other problems, right? But that's not really the case, right? Over time, what we start to see um, is very sort of aggressive, offensive raids by African uh, communities um, that result in the seizure of thousands and thousands of people and then the sale of those people to Europeans. Right, So war is kind of a glossy and perhaps slightly untruthful way of saying that powerful tribes tended to see slave raiding as an end in itself. Um, and they launched battles for the specific purpose uh, of gathering human cargo. Um, another source uh, of enslavement was law. Uh, 
or custom. Um, those convicted of various crimes, things like murder or adultery, um, threatening a noble, um, could be condemned to slavery rather than condemned to death. Again, though, it's, it's kind of a problematic framework because um, on its surface, it seems like what I'm saying is the legal codes of Africa were there waiting for Europeans to come and exploit them. Um, but that's not really the case, right? Instead, uh, the European presence slowly began to influence uh, the judicial systems of West Africa. Um, the presence of Portuguese merchants, for example, was an incentive to kings um, to change their legal codes, uh, to change penalties from, say, death to enslavement. Um, and historians have, have found as well that during the first two centuries of the slave trade, uh, West African laws tended to become harsher. Uh, the burden of evidence tended to drop um, and more and more people were being drawn into slave trade, into the slave trade through laws that seemed specifically designed to sort of entrap people um, so that elites could produce more and more human cargo. Um, what we're seeing in other words, is that the slave trade steadily transformed West African culture and becomes a point of orientation, right? Life begins to revolve around um, servicing uh, these European demands for enslaved people. Um, all of that is to say that when we think about the early slave trade, when we think about any human society, but especially when we're thinking about the early slave trade, it's not helpful to imagine two static societies that are simply slamming into one another. Um, one is white, one's powerful, um, and it's greedy, and the other is black and weak and just waiting to be exploited, right? That's, that's really not the way it happened. There's far more give and take, and there's far more fluidity between these cultures, and we're going to talk um, next week a little bit about how um, new cultures were arising out of these um, encounters. Um, this is a dynamic process. It's a process of cultural and economic change. Um, as I said at the beginning of the lecture, this is really um, one of the, the signal events in the history of uh, the world, right? Uh, the entire world is changing as the transatlantic slave trade matures. Um, okay, I'm going to leave it there. Big takeaway from this lecture, um, if nothing else, is that slavery is not one thing. Um, and that slavery in the Americas, um, which evolves out of the transatlantic slave trade, is distinct from other forms of slavery in the history of the world. Um, that slavery is a dynamic uh, concept. It can change depending on its social and cultural conditions. Um, and that many of the concepts that we use to order our world, things like European or African or white and black usually don't fit neatly onto the past, particularly the distant past, particularly uh, um, 500 plus years ago. Um, and one of the big questions we're going to explore in this class, and this is one of my favorite questions in human history, is how do you get from the messy world that I've been describing in this lecture into the kind of racist absolutism of the early United States? Um, that's a question that we're going to begin taking up in greater detail next week. Okay. Thanks for watching everybody. Um, and good luck on your first quiz.